for students today and um, as they prepare to go back to school. Uh, pray for parents as your, your sons and daughters prepare to go back to school. Amen. You know, the kids are like, I don't want to go. And the parents are like, oh, hurry up and leave. <laughs> um, but here's, here's the thing. As, as, we, as the new school year uh, begins, it brings all the hopes and the joys of a new season, right? Um, there's hopes and joys at different levels. Of different, you know, that person that's going into their senior year, they can't wait to finish. That little one that's starting kindergarten, mama can't, well, not all of them, but most mamas are ready to say, okay, let's go. Let's get this thing going. <laughs> It, there's hopes and joys and different emotions and everything that go on in that. You know, in our household, there's, the emotions are a little different. Um, yeah, Tiff and I, I've, I've recognized Tiff and I make a pretty good parent. I'm cheering, saying, she's leaving. And Mama's there, she's leaving. So, you know, we figure we balance each other out. We make a pretty good parent there. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that, that I'll be shedding tears on the way home, thinking of all the bills we have to pay for her to go. Uh, but, but anyway... Uh, but the, the season, the new school year starts, you know, it's a new season, it's a new year, it's a new chapter, it's a new opportunity. We also um, are faced with the reality that time moves on fast. However, as we think of this, we're not just spending time, get this, we're not spending time and just taking up space, but as followers of Jesus Christ, we must understand that our lives and our future are not ours, but they're His. Get this, our lives and our future, they're not ours. If we belong to Christ, they're not ours, they're His. I thank God for our nation. And, and I remember growing up, and I remember this thought of, man, you can be whatever you desire to be. And, and I, I appreciate that. But you know something? The longer um, that I've lived, the longer I've been in ministry, here's, here's the thought. That's, that's even prevalent in the, in the church world, in the church realm. We can be whatever we want to be. But you know something? If I belong to Christ, His, His plans are my plans. His future is my future. What He desires from me. And so listen, I, I, I do say, I can be whatever I desire to be. You know, that's why everybody comes to America. Because they can do what they want to do. Sometimes it's to our detriment, but they come because they have rights here that they don't have any place else. They come hoping to live the American dream. And I'm going to tell you something. The American dream is still false and falls short of God's dream for you. Because He has a hope and a future for us. But the idea is, is as, I, as I'm glad that we can say, hey, we can be whatever we want to be, but I think if we know Christ, mom and dad, if, if our sons and our daughters know Christ, then we need, to, we need to change that just a little bit and say, you can be whatever God desires you to be. Because we belong to Him. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's... I think probably the wrong thing is, is I can be whatever I want to be. No, I'm going to be what God desires me to be. And so, as we move forward, as we look through these things, I, I, I've been thinking about, and, and, and I, I really do, I love today. I love the aspect of praying for our students going back to school. It, it makes me, it, one of the things I love as being a pastor is getting to do baby dedications. I love that. For one reason, I love babies. And, um, but I, I, I love baby dedications. I love taking that opportunity and saying, God, as you've blessed us, we, we give this child back to you and ask the Lord that you would lead them. And this morning, in, in some aspects, that's what we're doing. As, as our sons and our daughters prepare to go to school, and I realize that some have already started, and so hopefully your prayers will be good enough to work until Monday when ours go into effect. <laughs> Not playing. Uh, but the point is, is, is that when we pray for them, listen, uh, it's, it's not just some little religious thing that we do. But we're dedicating their lives and dedicating their moments to the Lord. I want to read a passage to you. I'm going to go to Acts chapter 4. I'm reading out of the, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. A um, good friend of mine says that that's the one that Jesus used, and so I'll, I'll use it, I guess. Um, but Acts chapter 4, verse 23. 
I want to read this. In fact, I, I'm going to read it now, and then we're going to come, I'm going to set some things up, and then I'll come back to it in just a few moments. But I read it because it's an outstanding passage. It's after Acts chapter 3, where Peter and John are going to the gate beautiful. And remember the man, the lame man sitting at the gate, and Peter looks at him and he says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I give unto thee, rise up and walk. And those things, exciting things, they, you know, it says that the man leaps and jumps and is praising God and the people are praising God. They're saying, USA. Right? They're shouting our champion. And yet in all those things, here's what happens. Peter and John get arrested. Oh, isn't that, don't we love that? We do great things for God and we get persecuted. We do great things for God and we get a flat tire. <laughs> of course, you know, a lot of times we try to put those things together. Well, when I started serving God, then these bad things happened to me. And listen, bad things happen to everybody. It rains on the just and the unjust, as it says in Matthew. But the point is, is, is um, here we see in Acts chapter 4 the end result of that. All right? They've been threatened. They've been told, don't preach in the name of Jesus. And I love their response. Their response is, is hey, listen, <laughs> Whether it's right to obey you or to obey God, we don't know, but we can't but speak about the things that we've both heard and seen. Man, what power. What, how awesome is that? So Acts chapter 4. After they were released, they went to their own fellowship and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices to God unanimously. And listen, if there's not a time for the church to raise their voice unanimously, it's now. I'm not talking about vote unanimously. I'm talking about raise our voices and honor the Lord unanimously. And said, Master, this is their prayer. Master, you are the one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You said through the, through the Holy Spirit by the mouth of our father David, your servant... Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers assembled together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that, in your sla- that, in, that your slaves may speak your message with complete boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing, signs and wonders to be performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak God's message with boldness. Father, shake this place and shake us with your presence. Holy Spirit, convict us. Holy Spirit, teach us. Holy Spirit, challenge us today. Lord, that we would recognize that your hand is mightily upon us. Lord, not to, not to wilt back, not to fade away, but to stand strong. And Lord, I pray that this morning as we dedicate our students to you as they prepare school, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit would be released on them and in them and through them and for them. And Father, we give you thanks in your precious name. And everybody that believed it said, Amen. 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 Listen, and, and I'll, I'll touch this again at the end, but one of the things that, that as I was meditating about this, you know, and we always like, Lord, bless them, Lord, keep them, and, and we, we want to do that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But really, I just, this is what was in my spirit. Lord, unleash them. Give them the confidence and give them the courage to stand up and to stand out for your sake. Not just to go, well, uh, not to be mealy-mouthed, not to cower down, but to stand strong. In fact, if, well, you don't have a bulletin. The, the, the way that I titled this morning is Invade Their Space. And I want to say as we pray, listen, I, I believe that we're, we're, we're unleashing them <laughs> on their campus, on their teachers, on their, the other students, on the administration, on this community. Not for them just to do, but for us as the body of Christ to stand alongside with them. But I, I, I want to I give this, because the first part of this is a challenge to us as the body of Christ, as the church of adults, leaders, um, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, however that works for you. 
But I want to ch- create a challenge. Then I'm going to come at the end. I've got a challenge for our students. In Judges chapter 2, we begin to see the end of what we recognize primarily as the patriarchs. Moses, in fact, this talks about Joshua. And remember, Joshua, uh, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. You remember that song? If, you're, if you've been in church long enough and went to children's church, we used to sing that song. For some reason in my mind, there's a little jazz, it's a little jazz, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. I don't know why it's jazzy in my mind, it just is, and maybe that's the way we sang it. I, don't, I doubt it, because the church I went to was predominantly white, and I promise there wasn't much jazz. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. No, anyway. Um, but the point is, is, is we see here in Judges chapter 2, we see the end of an era and the beginning of another one, but it's sad. This is what it says, Judges chapter 2, verse 6. Joshua sent the people away, and the Israelites went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. In other words, after they had come into the promised land, after they had defeated the enemy, and God said, here's, what, here's what's yours, now Joshua's saying, go, go to your land, the place that's been uh, proportioned out to you, you go. Verse 7, the people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime, and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua, they had all seen the great works that he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in, in Timnath, um, Heresies, in the hill country of, of Ephraim, north of the Mount Gaash. That whole generation, now here's the sad part, that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors, and after them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord of the works that he had done for Israel. How sad is that? Think, think for just a moment. All the mighty acts that God did for the people of Israel, even in, during Joshua's lifetime, that there would come another generation after them. It says that they did not know God or the works, the mighty works that the Lord had done for Israel. You know, that's horrible. The first thing that we typically do is we begin to look at the generation. Those rebellious, lazy, no good for nothing. They always, they, they're elitist. They think they deserve something. They don't like to work, right? Isn't, in fact, we would say that. In fact, sometimes we say that about the generations behind us. And probably the generations in front of us said that about us. <laughs> but the truth to it is, if we understand Scripture, you know whose fault it is? The generations prior to because the generations prior are the ones that are supposed to pass it on. David would write in Psalms, what we recognize in Psalms 145. He said, one nation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. So you, we need to understand something today. It's my responsibility to pass it on to my kids and to my grandkids. And as far down as I have the opportunity to invest in. It's my responsibility. I can't say, well, my parents this and all this and the government that. And Listen, it's my responsibility. Mom and dad, it's your responsibility. Sadly, as we look at this and we look at this story and judges, there arose another generation how far removed did they have to be for that they didn't know about Joshua and the battle of Jericho? How far removed would they have to be not to know the story of Moses walking across and leading the, the children of Israel across dry land through the Red Sea? How many generations would, how many years, how, how long did it take for that to happen? See, many times we blame the next generation for how they are, but most of the time, if we look at it, the next generation is only a reflection of the previous generation. What they've allowed, we become. What we allow, which is really sad, because um, I, I was just thinking about this. Um, this is actually, in fact, just a few weeks from now, my, my, my class, my high school class will be celebrating their the, the thir- our 30th reunion, 30th, 30 year reunion. And I know I don't look that old. It's just, I don't age well or something. I don't know. Anyway. 
The point is, 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 I mean, it's like, wow, 30 years since I've been in high school. You know, my, I got to be, yesterday was my best friend in high school. He was in town because his, his daughter, who's a, his third daughter or his third child, which is a girl, is going to be a sophomore in high school and all these things. But, and they were in town for a volleyball tournament and so we spent time with him. But 30 years. And I think about the things that we, we faced and all the generation for me, man, the, the things that they face, the things that we faced as seniors in high school, students are facing as sixth graders. It's just the way it is. It's an attack. It's an attack of the enemy on, on students. It's an attack of the enemy on, on families. It's an attack of the enemy on the church. And I'm going to tell you why. You don't know why? Because he knows his time is coming. It's short-lived. And you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to take all the, everybody with him that he can. But we have a champion. And his name is Jesus, and he's not going to lose, and he's not going to forsake us, and he's not going to get to the end of it and go, well, I can't do this. He's going he's to deliver the goods. But you know something? It's our responsibility to pass that along. My responsibility. Our responsibility is the church. In fact, God would tell um, the Israelites in Deuteronomy, as Moses would write this down, declare this, he says, these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Deuteronomy 6, 6, 6 through 9, really, but I'll just read 6 and 7. Write it down. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, it says train him. Uh, the Word of God, Proverbs tells us, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he'll not depart from it. Listen, we, we, recognize, it's my, it's, we recognize it's our responsibility. Do not, I'm going to say this. If you expect the school systems, whether it be private or public, to teach your sons and daughters morality and convictions, you are wrong. I'm just telling you. Now, you go, well, that's the youth pastor and the pastor and, the, and, and all. No, listen, the ministry only comes alongside of parents to help encourage you and support you and challenge you to do those things that God's called you to do. Well, let the pastor preach about it. You know something? I'm only as effective as you'll allow it to be effective in your life. If you go today and have me for lunch, along with your slim chicken, I, I'm going to just tell you something. You know what your kids are going to do? They're going to show lack of value for the pastor and lack of value for God, lack of value for ministry and all those things. They're only going to do what we, they see us do. That's why it's important when our kids are in, in, in worship with us, we need to worship. Well, I'm tired. Because you don't know what happens when they get in worship. I'm tired. I, I, won't, I won't name the place, but I, I remember I, I, we were, when we were in youth ministry, I had, I had a parent come to me. And said, don't ask my kid to raise their hands in worship. And I wanted to wholly slap them. I'm like, are you serious? I'm at a Pentecostal church, and you're trying to tell me, we're not going to raise our hands in worship, and you're going to get on to me for this. Now, that wasn't the Destiny Center. It was, you know, it was one of those other God-forsaken places. No, I'm playing. But I'm just, no, I, and listen, I'm not trying to be mean or even really harsh. I'm just saying, are you serious? I'm trying to teach your kid to worship, and you're telling me don't do that. But you know something, we'll, let them, we'll look, go and let a coach cuss at them at the, at the school grounds and all that stuff, saying, well, that's making them better. For what? Now, listen, I know I've been there and been a part of it and all this. So I know it is. We, we, we'll let everybody else push them, but don't let them push them in the house of God. Because we're supposed to be passive. And I'm telling you, let's unleash them. And you know, so we're not going to unleash them passively. We're going to the, we're gonna have to give them the tools and say, hey, go get them. So, so here, here's the challenge, if I can get there. Here's the challenge to parents, leaders, and the body of Christ. First of all, we must invest in our children, in our students, time, talent, treasure. We, we have to invest. We can't sit back. Hey, listen, the world's investing Go watch TV. They're investing to, to win your, the hearts and souls of your sons and daughters. When they sit there and say, hey, this is the way you ought to live your life. Drink this and you'll, you'll face. Let me tell you something. It's a lie. And mom and dad, if we don't teach them and if we don't invest in them, you know something? They'll buy that lie because the rest of the world buys that lie. We have to invest. The second thing is we must believe in them. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I, I just had, I had a thought, my, my parents are here today, I, I remember something my dad said, I won't use it because it, it fits, but it doesn't fit right now, and, and I'll just let that be the end of that rabbit trail, but anyway, we must believe in them, believe in them, help them, um, the, the third thing is, um, is that we must raise our expectation of them. Expect them to succeed, to do their best, and to take responsibility. Raise the level. Don't lower the bar so they can be successful. Raise the standard and expect them to accomplish it. Well, he, little Johnny, he can't because, listen, raise the standard. I'm not trying to devalue them. I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to minimize the things that they struggle with in their life. But listen, if we ro- lower the standard, that's what everybody does. Raise the standard and say, this is what we believe in and this is where we stand and this is what we expect. We must pray for them and with them. For them and with them. You know how they learn to pray? When they hear people pray, the most influence, mom and dad will have the greatest influence on learning, our sons and daughters learning how to pray. You know something? I, I want my kids and, and Lord willing, grandkids and great grandkids, Lord willing, I want them to hear me pray. Amen. Man, I, I, just saying that, I, I remember this. My, my, my papa, oh, I just remember there'd be times, we'd be, we'd be in the car, we'd be driving somewhere. My dad was normally driving. I'd be in the middle. At least this is when, back when you could put three people in the front seat without getting a ticket, right? <laughs> and, I remember, and he'd be sitting there and he'd have his eyes closed and you'd just start hearing him pray in tongues. I remember that. And I remember the influence that it had on my life too. So now, you know, some, there's times I'm driving along and you know what I do? I'm praying in tongues. And if nobody's with me, I'm pretty loud about it too. I don't know. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's who I am. That's how I... But listen, let's pray with them and for them. Um, the other thing, we must love them unconditionally. You remember as we were doing the gospel prayer, you remember the third one is this, as he has been to me, so I will be to others. Listen, he's loved you unconditionally. Why can't we love them unconditionally? Well, you don't know my kid. <laughs> well, no, maybe not completely. And listen, I'm not saying that everything, everything's rosy, but listen, the Lord still loves us even when we are not heads. We love them unconditionally. The, the, the next thing that I say is a challenge. We invest, we believe, we, we, hold, we raise the expectation, we pray with them and for them, we love them unconditionally. And here's the, the, the last one I would say, and there could be several others, but listen, we must cheer them on. Everyone needs a cheerleader. You can do it. Well, I, I just, I, I don't, that coach doesn't like me. You can do it. We walk in the favor of God. We walk in the favor of man. Hey, it says this about Jesus, especially after, after we see when he's 12. It says that he grew in stature and favor with both God and man. We walk in, we walk in favor with God and with man. That doesn't mean that everybody likes us all the time, but we're still going to walk in his favor. And so we, we encourage, we challenge, we, we cheer them on. See, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 1, he says this, Therefore, since we also have such a great or such a large crowd of witnesses. In other words, what, it says, what it's saying right there, out of Hebrews chapter 11, the, the chapter of faith, and he talks about the men and women of faith, and he comes to the end of that and he says, Therefore, because we have such cheerleaders of faith that surround us. Listen, all of heaven is standing there saying, You can do this. Mom and dad, church, we need to do that for our our sons and our daughters. You can do this. You can stand for God in in the wicked world. Man, I wish I had a few more teenagers in here because I want you to know something. Mom and dad, for some reason in our mind, well, they turn 13, they get rebellious. That's a lie. You do not have to be rebellious at any point in your life. That's a lie. Well, they're teenagers. They're terrible twos. Well, if you let them be terrible at two, they'll be terrible at two, three, four, and five and continue on. But the point is this, is they do not have to rebel. And if you say that, well, they're 13, they're rebellious, then that's your problem, not their problem. You need to man up and woman up and say, hey, listen, this is the way we're going to live. 
I'm not saying that we don't face difficulties. We do. But the point is, that's a lie. For a teenager to think, well, I, I'm going to just get rebellious. Why? Why go through that nonsense? Why go through that hell? Emotionally, spiritually, and everything else. Why? And so we're going to cheer them on. Because everybody needs a cheerleader. So now go back to Acts chapter 4. And I love this passage, and this is the reason why. All these outstanding things God did through them, they go through persecution, and they come out on the backside of this thing, and you don't see them over in the corner going, oh, help us, right? At least that's the way Scripture shows. They're not there going, they're not, I don't hear, I don't, in what I read, I don't hear them whining about it. I don't, under, I don't hear them going, well, every time I try to step out for God, something bad happens. Why? I don't see that. I don't see them going, oh, God, help us, keep us, protect us, because we don't want to get in trouble. What do they say? Lord, unleash us on them even more. <laughs> That's what he's saying. That's what their prayer is. Lord, you've heard their threats. Now let your Holy Spirit come upon us that we may boldly, boldly speak your word. They weren't whining and crying about the things that they went through. They were saying, unleash us even more. Let your spirit come upon us even greater so that we can do greater things for the cause of Christ. And that's why I would say this morning as we pray for our students, listen, I don't want to just say, Lord, help them, and I'm going to pray that. But, Lord, I'm praying, unleash them for your glory. And you know who's going to help them? We as the body of Christ. Why? Because we're going to stand, we're going to pray with them, we're going to pray for them, we're going to pray um, in those moments, we're going to stand in the gap, we're going to be the ones that are going to encourage them, we're going to be the ones when they go to school and they go, well, nobody likes me, you say, oh, that's not true, because the Bible says that the favor of God is on your life, stand up. And so, that's our challenge. So we get to Acts chapter 4 again. And they don't go, this is unfair, and God, why are you doing this to me? And No. You see them standing in faith and saying, Lord, you hear it, here we go. So here's my challenge to our students. And Number one, our students are not powerless. Well, what I'm going to do, they won't let me stand for Christ. Yes, they will. Listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. If they'll, let, if they'll let the Muslims go in the corner and pray during school, you can stand, they can stand and pray. And when I say that, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not, I'm not trying to be um, arrogant or any of those things. I'm Listen, if they'll let somebody else stand, then they have to allow us to stand too. They're not powerless if the Holy Spirit is in them. 1 John 4.4, 4, uh, 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in me. Greater is the one that is in me than he that is in the world. Can I tell you something this morning? They're not powerless. The second thing is, we, I think we can pull out of that passage, even Acts chapter 4, is this, is that they have influence. They have influence. And listen, it's not because they're the most popular or the loudest or any of those things. I, and, I, and I use this illustration in first service um, not, not to be arrogant or not to, to make anything out of me. I just want to I say this. Probably one of the most popular kids, not a kid anymore, <laughs> one of the most popular kids in my class was my best friend. Everybody looked to, to Mike. But you want to know something? When Mike had a question, you know who he came and talked to? He came and talked to me. What do we do about this? What do you think? And when I say that, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm not trying to say, belittle him or anything. I'm just telling you. They have influence. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, talking, the, the Sermon on the Mount. He tells the disciples, he tells those people that are there, you are the salt of the earth. <laughs> salt has influence. You are the light of the world. Light has influence. If we are in Christ, we not only are not powerless, but we have influence. 
If we'll, if we'll allow, allow the, world, the Lord to use us. You don't have to be the most popular to be influential. You just have to allow the Lord to use you in whatever... And listen, it may not be influential with students. It may be influential with teachers. It may be influential in, in different areas. But the point is, is this morning as we pray, well, I want our students to understand that they are influential. And then, then the, the third thing is, is that you have purpose more than just trying to survive and make the grade. Oh, I'm so ready to graduate. I'm so, and, and that, that's the thing. I remember when I was young, I go, in, in my thought, right, didn't we have this thought, well, I can't wait till I get older, then I can do this, 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 and this. And now that I'm older, I'm like, I wish I could be younger, <laughs> right? We're not in this thing just so we can survive. I believe God's made us to thrive. And it's not just to make a grade, well, I, I, just, I just want to do good enough so I can get out. Listen, God has a purpose that is greater than just breathing in and out and eating and sleeping and doing just life. He has empowered us. He has empowered us. And then the fourth thing in this challenge, and, and it's this, um, to all of our students, you are loved. First of all, first and foremost, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we know this, that God loves us. And you go, yeah, God loves us, but I don't feel it. And my parents, all these things. Listen, I, I don't know how all of that looks for you and for our students, but I'm going to just tell you this. One of the things that I recognize, one of the things that makes us the most courageous is knowing that someone loves and believes in us. And when we love them and believe in them and support them, can I tell you something? They can be courageous in their school. I thank God there's times in my, in my own personal life where I'm like, I don't know about this. And Tiffany will go, no, you can do this. No, look at this and look at... And it gives me courage. I can remember in my, in, in my, own, in my own... When I was a kid, just different moments that I was spurred on. When I wasn't sure and wasn't sure how it potentially would look or what the uh, outcome might be, but I knew that mom and dad loved and they cheered me on, they encouraged me, and so I, I could stand in courage. Not knowing how it was going to end up, but I knew that if, hey, if I could just take this next step. But you're loved. So here's the challenge to students, and I'll be done. Number one, today's the day y'all really want to take notes um, when I don't give you notes. But anyway, first of all, this is the students. Do your best. Do your best. I'm not saying make A's. I'm, not, I'm saying do your best. Um, Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says this, and, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. The Father through Him. In other words, just do your best. We can't say, we can't say do 110%. That, that, that's not physiologically possible. Have you seen the commercial where the guy, I think it's a, for um, some hotel, um, and, and he says they, he all, does 110%. So this guy's standing there, and then he opens up his briefcase or something, and there's this other little guy about that tall saying 10%. So he's giving 110%. Have you seen that? It doesn't happen that way. But just do your best. Expect the best. Challenge the best. The next thing is, is you can learn. Mom and dad, do not let our sons and daughters come and say, I can't. Growing up, not, I've just heard this. I don't know that I ever heard my parents say this, but can't never could. <laughs> right? I can't learn. Yes, they can. You go, well, you don't know all of the learning disabilities. I, I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to devalue that or minimize that or make fun of that or any of those things. I'm just telling you something. You can learn. Why? Because the Spirit of God, the Creator of the universe, says that I'll guide you into all truth. I'll teach you. I'll help you. If we'll ask the Holy Spirit to help us, He will. Listen, whenever we say I can't, then what you're saying is, is that, that your limitation is greater than God's ability to overcome. I can't. And we realize that 
it says that this of Jesus, that he couldn't do great miracles in his hometown. Why? Because of the unbelief that was there. Listen, we can learn. Mom and dad, you can learn. Most of the time, the way we confess, the things that we say, Junior and Susie take that on. Well, nobody likes me. I don't have any friends. You know what our sons and daughters say? Nobody likes me. I don't have any friends. I'm horrible at math. Well, so am I. I'm horrible at math. And I'm not saying you've got to be good at math. I'm, I'm using that because in my household, that's what we hear sometimes. I'm, I'm supposedly the mathematician, and Tiffany's like, hey, can you add this for me? You know, and it's just, it, most of the time, it's more of a preference than it is that you can't, right? Because you know something, you put dollar bills in front of that woman's face, and she can count them. <laughs> just think it's green. I promise you, you can do it. (laughs) She's good with money. But the point is, is you can learn. And then the third thing is, and this is more practical than maybe it is spiritual, even though some moms may have said this before, cleanliness is next to godliness. Maybe that's as godly as we get in the whole thing. But take care of yourself. I got a a bunch of amens in the first service on that one. I I don't know, maybe you had stinky kids in the first one. I don't know. But um, listen, you're a reflection of Christ and you're a reflection of your parents. Hey, they didn't say this just because it was some little neat um, saying, dress for success. I, I remember this, and, and I may be off on a little bit, and maybe exaggerate just a little bit, but I remember, especially when I was in elementary school, I, I can't remember wearing too many T-shirts to school. I remember my dad would always encourage me to wear a, a, a shirt with a collar on it. Because he'd say, those teachers are watching. They know. They, they recognize what you're doing. And I don't know if it helped me, but you know something? I walked in favor with all my teachers. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying oh, go get a whole new wardrobe. That's not what I'm pointing. Don't, don't go there. I'm just telling you, we, the way that we take care of ourselves reflects our attitude about ourselves and reflects to other people how they'll treat us. If we're dopey and mopey, you know how they're going to treat us? Dopey and mopey. <laughs> Dress for success. I don't think you have to go put on a three-piece suit to do that. Man, that's awesome. Way to go, Pastor Scott. I know, I'm on. Hey, another thing is, is guard your conversations. This is part of taking care of yourself. Guard your conversations. Because the Word of God tells us that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whenever we talk, you know, something shows the condition of our heart. You know what, the, you know what I want people to see about my heart is that I love God. Not that I'm perfect, not that I'm perfect, because I'm not. Y'all have been around here long enough to recognize that one. Um, but the point is, is I, want, I want my heart to reflect Christ. So guard my conversations, or guard your conversations. Do your best, you can learn, and take care of yourself. And you go, well, because well, listen, we're a reflection of Christ, first and foremost. I want my life. I want my life to be a a billboard that is a testimony about Christ. Not that I'm perfect, not that I have it have it all I have all the answers, but that my life is honoring to him. So this morning I go ahead and let the children's church in. If you if you guys will get ready, I want to show this video. Um, if all the kids will come, all students, all students come. Homeschooled students, public school students, private school students, come and stand right here. I want you to see this video as they're coming.
all of that and more. Listen, I believe that we're not just praying, Lord, protect them. Even though we're praying that, but we're praying, Lord, give them the courage to stand and to be a light inside the darkness. See, we believe that in our prayers this morning that we're setting a course. We're preparing a way and influencing heaven to fulfill God's plan in their lives. Do you get that? We believe that this morning that our prayers are setting a course and preparing a way and influencing heaven to fulfill God's plan in their lives. Not just today, but every day that we would pray for them, every day that we'd stand in the gap for them, every day that we would remember them, every day that you'd drive through a school zone and you'd say a prayer for that school and our, our children. Listen, it's not just, Lord, help them, but Lord, we unleash them for your glory. So I'm going to ask mom, mom and dad, I'm going to just ask church, will you stand this morning? Would you just reach out your hands? We're going to pray. Come on, church. Let's pray for them. Father, we just thank you for children are a blessing. That's what your word says. They're a blessing. And so, Lord, we recognize the blessing that they are to us, not only to our families, but to our church, to our community, to our schools. And so, Father, we pray for them right now that as they would go, Lord, as they would go, Lord, not only would you help them to be successful in learning, Lord, help them to do their best. Lord, help them to recognize that they walk in your favor. They walk in your presence. They walk in your anointing. But Lord, we pray right now as your hand would be mighty upon them. Lord, we ask that you would unleash them by your spirit on their schools, upon their friends, upon their campuses, upon their communities, within their families. Lord God, use them in a powerful way to be an example and a testimony of Christ. Lord, we just thank you today for all that you've done And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to continue to do in them and through them. And Lord, we just give you thanks and praise in your precious name. And everybody that believed it said, come on, let's give the Lord praise this morning. Come on. Young, be seated. Everybody can be seated. Students can be seated. If you're in children's church, go find your parents real quick. If they're not here, just find your seat. and You can go live with Pastor Scott and Tiffany. And some of the parents are like, I'll, I'll take you up, I'll take you up. Listen, don't talk to Pastor Tiffany about it too much, man. I'm telling you. She's like, we should have had 10 more. I knew we should have had more. I like, know we should have had more. <laughs> That's the reason. Right there is the reason we didn't have any more. We love her, though. I'm going to miss her. <laughs> I miss her a lot. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm messing. But hey, listen, um, this morning, um, I know last year we gave away... Um, these books, praying circles around your children. Listen, if you're mom and dad, grandparent, aunt or uncle, and you didn't get one of these, I have some available. I don't have many are available. Listen, I would just say this. If you've just misplaced yours, that doesn't mean that you don't have one. Be, go and find it. And if you can't find it, you can come back. And if I have extras, I'll give them away. But if you didn't get one of these, um, listen, I, I believe it's important. Mark Batterson, who we're going to be doing his study here in September, um, probably one of my favorite writers, um, and uh, easy to read, those kind of things. But this is a real challenge. It gives you some, some methods to pray over and around and for your kids. And so I just want to give this to you as a blessing if you don't have it. If you do have it, hey, go back and, and go through it again at the start of the school year. If you don't, pick one up. Like I said, I have a few in the full year. And, and uh, just want to be a blessing to you like that.